Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I am absolutely thrilled you're here. You're going to get tremendous value from the gentleman I'm interviewing today. And this is an unusual interview as we've never broached this topic before. Surprisingly, actually, it's long overdue. Uh, his name's Ehud Gersten, and he is in the world of Delaware Statutory Trusts, DSTs, they're called. And um, this is going to get a little deep. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, this is kind of like an alternative to the 1031 exchange, which you've probably heard of. And so, um, you know, buckle up and uh, and and I hope you enjoy this conversation uh, with Mr. Gerson. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, Rod. Yeah, let's have some fun. So, so tell you know, give us a little bit of your background because it's pretty pretty interesting, frankly, and and wide reaching. Um, and uh, and then let's get into DSTs. Sure. So. Um... I was, uh, skipping ahead a bit, I, I was a, and still am a licensed attorney in California, and I was a real estate litigator for about 15 years, hmm. and doing a lot of real estate law, real estate litigation, and I thought I knew everything there was to know about real estate, and uh, found out that wasn't the case. And I had uh, a, a good friend that was also an attorney, and he came to me one day and asked me to help him with a 1031 exchange. In fact, he was selling the building where I was renting an office space from him. Oh, wow. And he wanted me to sell the building and help him with the 1031 exchange. Because you're a broker in California as well, I'm a, correct? Exactly. I'm a broker as well. But I told him, his name's David. And I said, David, I don't do this. You know, I just, I had the brokerage license. I still do. But I, ne I just use it for myself. I never used it uh, with clients. And he said, no, I want you to, I want you to help me with the 1031. So in the process of researching, you know, the 1031 options for him, I was only aware of options where you can go out, you know, you sell your property, you go out, you buy another property. You identify it, you have a certain amount of time to identify, and you've got a certain amount of time to close. Exactly, right. precisely. So um, a good friend of mine, she's been a real estate broker for over 35 years, and she, I was talking to her about trying to find something for David, and she says to me, I heard about this thing called DSTs, Delaware Statutory Trusts, you know, maybe we, you know, if you want, you can go read up on it. And I started digging in and researching it. Mm -hmm. And I had been looking for a way out of law for a while. I mean, being a litigator can be oh, that's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah. Nobody loves you either. So exactly. it's, it's, no one loves you. A lot of rejection. Yeah. A lot of rejection, a lot of, 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 uh, of fighting mm -hmm. with people you don't even know necessarily. Yeah. So I, I had been looking for a way out of litigation, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I discovered DSTs, which, you know, we can get into it, mm -hmm. but I really, I love the concept of what it could do. So I went out, uh, you have to have a securities license to uh, offer DSTs, went out, got my securities licenses, and uh, that's kind of from a 30,000 foot view. That was, yeah, that was quick. Now, now, where all of you lived again as well? Just, just uh... So I was born in Israel, mm -hmm. and uh, when I was four years old, moved to South Africa. Uh, wow. so when I first learned to speak English, I had a South African accent mm. and, uh, uh, when I was 12, we moved to Canada and I got teased by the kids in my class for, for saying things strangely the to accent. the accent. So, um, uh, yeah, I got rid of the South African accent. Uh, I grew up in Canada, then went to university in New Zealand. I, I, um, got my first two degrees. I have a law degree, uh, from the university of Auckland in New Zealand, as well as a political science degree, mm. graduated from the university in New Zealand, and then went and did my master's in law uh, at Boston University. Mm. Graduated from Boston University, didn't like the cold weather, moved out to San Diego. Uh, the rest is history. The rest is history. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I would I would take San Diego. Listen, I love Boston, don't get me wrong, but, but I can't do the weather either. So DSTs, okay? So why don't you describe for those of you, and there's a few of the, I'm sure don't know what a 1031 exchange is. Just real quick, high level, what's what's the exchange? Why are there limitations? And then why a DST might make sense? Absolutely. So a 1031 exchange has actually been around in one form or another since 1921. Now, I know Biden's trying to get rid of it. Uh, so there is that as well. But uh, but sorry, I interrupt. Please continue. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, they, they're, they're, he, they're currently thinking about getting rid of it. It's not the first time that a uh, uh, president has thought about getting rid of it. It's been around for 102 years. So it's, it's, a, it's a very successful piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason it's 
been so successful is that if you're doing a 1031 exchange, if you sell a property, an investment property, mm -hmm. and you take the proceeds from that property and within certain timelines, you invest it in another piece of real estate, then you can defer paying the capital gains on that, which can be pretty significant. Sure. So the 1031 exchange, it's called 1031, by the way, because it's section 1031 of the IRS code. Yeah. So that's, that's the reason. And so the 1031 has been around for a long time. It's very successful and it helps uh, people may not only maintain their wealth, but potentially grow their wealth mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time because they're constantly- Kicking that can down the curb. You know, they're kicking that, that tax down the curb. So talk about the limitations of it. Because it has some limitations. Of 1031 exchanges? Yeah. For sure. So one of the, yeah, one of the limitations, well, first of all, let's talk about the, the timing, right? So you, you don't, that's what I meant by limitations, frankly, is it the timing. The timing, you have a very short time to identify. So you have more, so once you sell your property mm -hmm. uh, that you want, that you, you want to exchange right. the money from into another property, mm -hmm. you've got 45 days, a month and a half to figure out where you're going to place that money. You got to identify. Now you have 180 days to close. 180? 180 it goes after the 45 or 180 from start day inclusive one. from day inclusive. one okay so yeah. 180 days to close six months to close but uh but you've got to identify now yeah i know you can identify multiple properties even if you don't take them all but you've got to find the ones you need and that that's been a real challenging over the last few years with it and and you know i think people have you know been desperate with their 1031 money trying to place it and maybe even done deals maybe they shouldn't have because they were so desperate to place it, right? Now, I know the timing is not the only limitation. There's also limitations around debt. Um, without going too far in the weeds, you want to give us a quick overview on that piece? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if I'll give you a very basic example. If you sell a property for a million dollars and you've got 500000 of equity, 500000 that you owe to a bank you, right. that you need to pay off, mm -hmm. when you sell that property, you're gonna the bank's going to get paid first. They get their half million first. You need to then take that half million in order to fully defer. You have to find a property that's equal or greater value. So you need to find a property that's a million or more for because that's what you sold. Right. But the problem is, especially in today's environment with rates being so high, you need to figure out what you're going to do with the debt component because you have only $500,000 to invest. So uh, that could be pretty significant nowadays because you're either going to have to take money out of your pocket to cover the debt portion mm. or you're going to have to go get a loan. Right. So for a lot of people, it's very difficult. And you have to identify and do this in a very, very short period yeah, of time. You got to move quick. Okay. All right. So that's 1031, guys. So now let's talk about a DST and why you love it. A variety of reasons. The, okay. the, 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 the DST, just from a 30,000 foot view, they, they've they been around since the 80s. The reason it's called a Delaware Statutory Trust, mm -hmm. it's simply because it's set up under Delaware law. But the but the actual offerings, the investments are, I've actually, I don't think I've ever seen an offering yeah, in federal. Delaware. Aren't, aren't they federal? They're federal. Yeah, yeah. They're federal. Now, Delaware is awesome. We love Delaware. I have almost all my LLCs there because they have really good anti-creditor laws. And anonymity in some case as yeah. well. I mean, obviously there's Wyoming as well and there's Nevada as well, but I think Delaware is kind of the cream of the crop as far as as far as asset protection. Yes, absolutely. And and the other reason that Delaware is so popular is that they have a very solid, and this is the lawyer part of me speaking. Mm -hmm. Historically, their case law has been very consistent. So, what people investors and syndicators they want to know that you know if they are doing something that it's very likely to be upheld by a court because that's been done before it upheld yeah we've we've done you know big you know multi-million dollar loans and the lenders have insisted on our operating agreement and ownership entities being in Delaware. I mean, they've actually insisted on it rather than the state the asset was purchased in. So, yeah, I, yeah, I don't doubt it. All right. So anyway, I, I, I derailed it for a minute. No, no, it's all right. It's no problem. So um, so it's, it's, it's structured under Delaware law. And in 2004, the IRS came out with the revenue ruling. It's revenue ruling 2004-86. Okay. And in that revenue ruling, they said that... Um, uh, DSTs qualify for 1031 exchanges, subject to certain rules, but they qualify as a vehicle for doing a 1031 exchange. So you could do a 1031 exchange utilizing a Delaware Senate. And go right into a, a DST. They can go right into a DST. So the same- Or multiple DSTs. So we can talk about that in a minute too. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And that's one of the great benefits about, you asked me what I love about DSTs is, right. um, let me explain before I get into it. So the, the, the minimum investment in a DST is $100,000. The reason that becomes really important is because let's assume the same example we had before. You've, you're selling a property for a million dollars. Let's assume you've got no debt for now. Okay. 
you sell a property for a million dollars, you need to allocate that. Well, you can technically invest in 10 different DSTs because the minimum is $100,000. And so what you're doing is, is you're diversifying your investment. So rather than having concentrated risk, where you sell one property and then you're just buying another property, right. now you can be in multiple properties, in multiple geographies, in multiple asset classes. So you're not eliminating risk. Uh, you know, we're in the world of securities. Sure. Uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Right, 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 right. I have disclaimer, to... disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Exactly. Disclaimer. Right. But but you you blur you brushed over something really quickly there. So you can be in also multiple asset classes as well, not just all. I mean, this is a multifamily podcast, but you can be in self storage. You could, I wouldn't be office right now. Please don't do no, it. No, right. I But but you know, self storage, mobile home parks. Uh, you know, industrial, office warehouse, flex space. You know, there's a lot of asset classes that are still killing it right now. I, I'm not even sure about retail. Be careful there too. But but, but that's kind of cool too, that you could diversify into other asset classes with those funds. Absolutely. We, yeah. I mean, we even have, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but we even have oil and gas, mineral, right. mineral rights. Right. So uh, that qualifies for 1031, subterranean uh, uh, okay. mineral rights. Okay. We have in Florida, we have manufactured housing. We have self-storage. We have multifamily, uh, where you're a specialist sure. in. Um, uh, we have um, industrial, life sciences. So you really have the entire gamut. What's of life sciences? Usually, typically, you'll see things like uh, pharmaceutical companies. So okay. they're they're the tenant. So technically, it's uh, it, okay. So so it's single tenant retail or something like that. Okay, so it's retail or office, but it's 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 in life sciences. I've tenant got it exactly. Sorry, I thought I was missing some. Okay, so so um, so benefits are the fact that you can diversify your assets, the fact that you can put a hundred thousand in multiple things, and a hundred thousand not a tremendous amount of money in our world. Um, so. You can really diversify, and you can do yeah other asset classes. Um, any other benefits the, to it? Yeah, well, one of the the big ones uh, in the example we again used before for you're selling your property for a million dollars, you have a half million dollar loan. Right. If you were to go out and buy direct, you have to figure out where you where you're going to get those funds. You got to borrow the money yourself too. You got to borrow the money with DSTs. Many of the DSTs come with leverage or a debt already on it. The investor gets the benefit of that debt. But doesn't have to qualify for that debt, and does it's non recourse to them. Yeah. Before we start recording, you gave me an example of this. So let's say, so let's say a big outfit. You gave a name, uh, Cantor, I think you said. Cantor Fitzgerald. Cantor Fitzgerald, huge firm. You know, buys an asset for fifty million. They put a twenty five million dollar loan on it. Very common. Okay. Then um, they're signed on that loan. They've got non recourse debt there, but um, you're getting the benefit of the higher returns because there's debt. Okay, because the, the more debt, the higher return you're going to have. That's just the way it works. The the returns are based on the amount of equity in a deal, the amount of cash in a deal. And so you're getting the benefit of that, but you're not signing on the debt. And not only that, you also get the benefit of depreciation. Oh, yeah. So you get the benefit of depreciating the, the, the asset, and you're not on the hook for the debt. And the, typically, the rates, we were talking before, the rates that a company like Cantor, to use an example, mm -hmm. will get on a long-term 10-year loan, for example, is much better than I could get, for example. Right. I mean, the, especially nowadays, it's right. pretty significant. Right. So they get all the benefits of the debt without having the downside of the debt. And so just out of curiosity, I, I, I um, by the way, guys, I asked him some questions ahead of the interview because I want to sound like a complete moron because I'm not that familiar with these. OK, I should be and I'm not. So this is a de educating me as well as you guys. But, uh, you know, so if um, they if they're you say they get the benefits of depreciation, do you see cost segregation and things and bonus coming up in these things? Absolutely. You do. OK. Any of these DSTs will come with a cost segregation analysis, okay. which investors can then utilize. Benefit from. Benefit from. Exactly. And we still got 80 percent bonus depreciation still going on. So they get they'd be able to share, be able to use that as well. The same rules that apply for regular. It's still real estate. Same as a syndication. Exactly. It's the same sense. OK. Exactly. Now. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, um, you, you still, you know, you've got to leave your money in until the deal is done. You're not going to get taken out of the deal until the deal has had a liquidation event of some sort. Is the liquidation event always a sale or is it sometimes a refinance? Very good question. It has to be a sale. It has to be a sale. Because when the IRS, it's a very good question. So when the IRS blessed DSTs in 2004, mm -hmm. one of the requirements was, is that you cannot do capital calls to investors mm. and you cannot do a refinance. Oh, okay. So you have to so you have to sell the asset. And that so typically what will happen, let's say in five to six, seven years, the asset sells, the asset manager that's managing this asset on investors' behalf, they'll sell the asset, 
And then at that point in time, they'll notify the investors and investors can do one of three things. They can either cash out they can do another. They can roll it over to a new DST if they wanted to. If they so 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 when they cash out, I'm sorry. When that DST sells, they don't have to take the money and pay tax on. No, it. they can they can identify. You can help them identify some other DSTs and and re direct. reallocate, or they can buy direct. Or direct, yeah. All right. Now your firm is called Perch Wealth. Perch Wealth. Okay. And this is what you guys do. You basically broker these DSTs for lack of a better way to put it. Correct. Yeah. This is this is what we focus on. We're specialists in this area and this is what we do day in and day out. And, and so do you counsel someone, let's say someone's selling an asset and so they they reach out and say, hey, I'm thinking about, you know, doing this 1031 to a DST and you help facilitate that. We help facilitate that. And, and really our job is to act as a uh, 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 counsel, wise counsel. Consultant. Yeah. Consultant and as advisors. And I and, and what we do, I have to be very careful because there's a legal term for financial, but we're not, we are advisors, but, right. not, um, but we're helping people. We're consulting to them and, and telling them based on our experience where we think there's a highest probability that they will actually, uh, there's no guarantees, but the highest probability of, of that being a successful investment. Okay. So our job is really to understand the uh, environment. So we we know the sponsors, we know their executive teams, we know the due diligence they're doing, we know the underwriting that they're doing. Okay. Then one of the things we'll look at is we'll look at the appraisal reports, we'll look at the area. If it's multifamily, for example, we look at things like what's the competition around there. We do. Okay, so you do some you do some due diligence on the asset as well. Yeah, because our clients rely on us. Right. Right. Yeah. So well, I was glad to hear that. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, when you just said appraisal, I'm like, oh, that's not enough. You got to go deeper than that. So you're actually checking comps and everything else. We're checking everything. And so the, in the same way that uh, a sophisticated investor will go out and buy something by themselves. Right. Now, mind you, the asset managers, the companies like Cantor, to use mm -hmm. them as an example, they've already done their own due diligence. Sure. And they. They're very good. Yeah, and you're reviewing what they've done, basically. It, 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 is, a, is that an accurate statement? We're reviewing what they've done, and we also, we, we it, you know, old Ronald Reagan uh, uh, quote, you know, trust but verify. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, good, good. And I, you said something that surprised me, and that was that on at any given time, there's only about 44 or so of these DSTs going. Is there a reason there's so few? You know, it's still, it's still... It's still fairly new. It's fairly, it's new and it's not new. It's, okay. it's, it's interesting because as an industry, it's, it's, you know, maybe last year, maybe eight to 10 billion of DST placements, which is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the overall amount of money that's gone into 1031s, right. it's a smaller amount of, that's just last year. So there's a lot of what I do and a lot of what uh, my partner does, my business partner, Ben, and a lot of what our team does is we're educating a lot. We're talking to that's why you're here. You're here in my studio educating. Exactly, and and it's it's and but we're educating attorneys, real estate attorneys, yeah. tax attorneys, CPAs, real estate brokers. Many don't know this exists as an option, right? And including, of course, investors. Well, I've heard about it as I told you before we started recording. I've heard about it for a long time. You know, you approached me, and I, I liked what I heard and what I saw. And and this is something you guys should know. You should know about this as an alternative. You know, if you've if you've relied on 1031 exchanges in the past, for example. Now, let me ask you this. I hate to go negative here, but you know, the environment is changing, and there's 75 percent year over year decline first quarter of this year, at least in the multifamily space. There's a lot of commercial real estate debt that's in trouble. We only talk about office. Office is a train heading towards a brick wall, but but. You know, a, a third of all commercial debt is adjustable. Um, you know, we know what's happened with the rates. And we, I mean, rate caps are insane. I, I saw an article uh, about uh, the difference in the rate caps in 2020 to today. And I give you an example, guys. Uh, if you got a rate cap, you know, which caps your interest rate on an adjustable rate loan. If you got a rate cap uh, of, of $100 million in 2020, 3%, so the rate wouldn't go up more than 3% for three years, Okay. That was $23,000 in 2020. That same rate cap today for $100 million, 3% for one year is $2.3 million. Yeah. And so, so you know, people are really going to have a tough time either refinancing or selling. And so, you know, I see the market shifting dramatically over the next couple of years. There's $1.6 trillion in commercial debt coming due by the end of next year. And so... You know, I mean, I'm telling all my peeps, there's going to be opportunity and there is going to be opportunity. And so if there were ever a time to learn this business, it is right freaking now because there's definitely going to be opportunity. It's going to be a lot of pain too. 
So I don't know. You got any thoughts on that? You got any feedback on yeah. that? I'd love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And if you spoke to my partner, Ben, I mean, he's he's um, he's been extremely bearish and pessimistic for a long time. Right. That's one of the reasons we're in this industry, though, because if someone's doing a 1031, they need to find a solution. Right. Otherwise, they're going to pay a lot in taxes, especially if they live in a place like California, where they're potentially 50%, you know, of what it's crazy. So Tom, give me start, and I just saw what it. Oh, never mind. That was a gun thing. Never mind. I just saw something Newsom was pushing, but never mind. Sorry, I was going to go down. No, the that's all right. Political rabbit hole. No, no, that's the right. only thing I couldn't live with. I love San Diego, but anyway, please continue. So that's one of the reasons that that I love DSTs because, again, you're not going to eliminate risk by investing in DSTs, but you're going to help mitigate it by diversifying your investment. So there's no guarantee that one investment is going to, or all of them are going to sure. work. But if you've taken your money that you've worked very hard for your entire life, uh, by the way, I should also say most of our investors tend to be baby boomers, right? They've worked mm. their entire lives. They're retiring. They're retiring. They're tired of managing tenants. They don't want to deal with phone calls in the middle of the night that the toilet's broken, the roof's right. leaking. So for them, these this is passive income. Sure. Um, and so, but they can they can spread out that risk by investing in multiple. Yeah, I actually like that. You know, I can tell you in 2019, Office was like the primo la primo asset class, and nobody knew what was going to happen in 2020, and now it's been decimated. Nobody wants to work in an office anymore, so you never know what could happen in any of these different asset classes in real estate or real estate in general, and so that is attractive. That diversification is attractive for sure. Um, you know, I think the issue is going to be whether or not they can sell. That's going to, to, to be able to have the money to diversify, but but um, you know, time will tell on all that. Uh, I'm speaking at a big conference next week, and it'll be interesting to see what uh, a lot of my contemporaries feel about, you know, I'm super bearish. I've been bearish for a long time. In fact, I thought COVID was going to be the catalyst. It wasn't, of course. But the, the good thing about multifamily is other asset classes didn't get help in, with COVID. I mean, you know, office didn't get help. Retail didn't get help. Uh, you know, industrial didn't get help. We got hundreds of thousands of dollars in tenant assistance. You know, we uh, love multifamily. Um, but yeah, so... so um, so just, are you doing anything else besides DSTs or is that, that pretty much it right now for you? We, I would say that 99% of our business is DSTs. We have, uh, we do opportunity zones occasionally. Oh, so, uh, I'll speak to that for a second. What, in, in what regard? So the opportunity zones, sometimes someone has a blown exchange at 1031, oh. so they don't want to have to pay or they want to defer their taxes. Mm -hmm. It's not the, the necessarily the first option, but it's another option. Hmm. Or let's say you're selling a business and it doesn't qualify for a 1031 exchange, or you're selling stocks that have appreciated. I, I have a, a buddy that's sitting on Apple stock. I think he's had for like 20 some odd years. Wow. If he sells that, he's going to take a big tax hit. So right. an opportunity zone is potentially an option for him to- So he can divert that 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 profit into an OZ and, and defer the tax? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I didn't know that. Defer oh. until 2027, beginning at 2027. There's there's apparently talk. I actually talked to one of the Opportunity Zone sponsors yesterday. Uh -huh. There's talk about extending that. I don't know if they'll extend it. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we do a little bit of Opportunity Zones. We have other types of cash investments, investors that they just have money sitting in the bank and they want to uh, invest it somewhere. So we have everything we do is real estate pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um ground up development work, things like that. But the, the DSTs is is really our, our bread and butter. It's really our niche. Got it. And, uh, you know, going back to what's coming, I, I, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm extremely bearish as well. And I actually don't think that most people understand this tsunami that's headed towards. I, they don't. And, yeah. and, and I mean, I'm I'm forecasting a whole lot of bank failures, uh, you know, and then the question begs, are they going to prop it up and print more money? And if they do, what does that do to inflation? And I mean, it's just like a double-edged sword. Um, so, you know, are they going to let the banks fail or are they going to prop them up? It'd be a real interesting question to answer. But, um, you know, I, I do believe that uh, we're going to have a catalyst here in the near future. Something's going to pop and, and we're going to see some serious pain and opportunity. With crisis comes opportunity. A hundred percent. How come you don't invest? I do. Oh, you do, do invest. Yeah, I, I, I've been personally invested in DSTs. Well, I mean, so I, not, not, no assets yourself, just all DST investments. Um, well, I like the diversification. Okay. And I don't... And I like the How, when you believe in what you're doing, I mean, yeah. invest in it. Okay, fair yeah, enough. Absolutely. Fair enough. That speaks to how you feel about it. So just to confirm, 
this investment, this DST investment is pretty much like investing passively in any syndication or, you know, where you're investing passively. You're giving up control, obviously, because the general partners have the control, same, same situation. And it's not liquid. You, your money's got to stay in there until they have a liquidation event of some sort, just like a syndication. So, right. you know, if they, if they, well, they, well, liquidation is sale. They have to sell, right? Uh, in, in the syndication, they can refi or sell. That's our model is we buy, we refi, get our investors their money back and stay in it legacy. But, but so they, they, they sell and then you can reinvest in another DST, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or cash out if you want. Or cash out, of course. And, but you can, and then you can pay some tax. The other thing I'll mention that, that, that I didn't mention is sometimes people say, well, I want to buy my own property, right? I sold my property for a million dollars. Right. And I don't want, I like to maintain control. Right. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Israel and Israeli clients in particular, they're, they're averse to anyone. Well, I'm a control free too. Control free. Yeah, 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 exactly. So is there a solution? Well, so they'll come to me and they'll say, okay, so you sell your property for a million dollars and you find your dream property, but it's only 800,000. Okay. So you've got $200,000 left to boot that you otherwise have to pay taxes on. You could take that 200,000 and put it into a DST. So you could split it. You could do a 1031 for that $800,000 property and whatever's left over can go into a DST. Exactly. I'm really glad that you brought that up because I was going to ask that and I forgot earlier. Okay. It's, it's, it's like, it's another, DSTs are another arrow in your quiver. You right. have another, uh, it's very malleable. You can, you know, you can use it to your advantage. And I just think it's a, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a great option for people to know about. Love it. Love yeah. it. Hey, Huda, I appreciate you coming out here. I know you're living on the other side of the uh, of the state. Uh, you told me your wife's having fun shopping here in Sarasota. A lot of great shopping. Fiance. Oh, she, fiance. Yeah, no, she's okay. yeah, on the route. <laughs> oh, all right. Congratulations there. Bad. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to meet you, my friend. Likewise. Thank right. you. Thanks. So one other quick thing. We encounter so many people that are frankly frustrated. You know, they're looking in the mirror and they're frustrated that they haven't been able to escape the rat race. They haven't been able to build cash flow to the point where they're able to have financial and time freedom with their families. You know, and maybe they see other people buying real estate and creating, you know, incredible cash flow. And they think, well, it's just scary. You know, buying apartments is intimidating. And I get it. See, that's why we created our Warrior Mentorship Program. They're our coaching students and they've had extraordinary results. My students, I've been teaching about five years and own upwards of 140,000 units now that we know of, right? And we feel like it's just getting going. Now we're looking to grow this group and really take it to the next level. And honestly believe that the greatest transfer of wealth could be upon us right now with this current economic environment. Everything's going on sale. So we're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework, really like a blueprint or a map, literally step by step. And then they're able to leverage our systems and our incredible network to raise money and equity, to find deals and close those deals and build partnerships really nationwide. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more in our incredible network and take advantage of the unbelievable opportunities that are upon us, you can apply to my Warrior Mentorship Program by texting the word CRUSH to 72345. Or you can go to mentorwithrod.com. And what we'll do is we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out and see if it's a fit. Now, again, you can go to mentorwithrod.com or text the word CRUSH to 72345 to apply and we will speak soon.